The interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. The veteran's name is David Lyle. He was born on September 18, 1945, and served in the Air Force and Navy during the Vietnam era. He achieved the rank of commander. We are recording this on April 1, 2014. I am Heidi Gerstmeyer, and I am conducting the interview. No relation. So can you just tell me a little bit about your childhood and where you grew up? I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina, downtown Charleston and lived there until I was uh, 11 years old when we, when my family moved to, to Walhalla. Uh, my, mother, my mother's family was from the first settlers of, of Walhalla and so that was a, a natural place to, for us to go. In fact, I was the third generation who was born in Charleston, moved to Walhalla to grow, go to school, moved back to Charleston to um, uh, to work and then moved to Walhalla to retire. Uh, I didn't work in, in Charleston, but I've worked everywhere else around the United States. Right. Um, <clears throat> it, uh, moved to Walhalla in 1956, went to uh, grammar school, middle school, and graduated from Walhalla High School in 1968. I mean, excuse me, 1963. Uh, when I graduated, I, Went to Clemson. I never, I never thought about going to any other place. Uh, only applied to Clemson. So, if Clemson did not accept me, I don't know what I would have done. Probably gone into service right then. But, um, like I say, I graduated from Walhalla. Went to Clemson, and at that time, Clemson uh, required freshmen and uh, sophomore males to take ROTC. I thought that once I finished uh, sophomore ROTC that I would never have to put on a uniform again. But the Vietnam War changed all that and after two years, uh, got after the two years uh, mandatory, I got out of ROTC for a year. Then when I realized that it was going to take me more than four years to graduate and my draft board would have been on my back, I decided to go into advanced ROTC. So I did that, went to um, uh, Myrtle Beach Air Force Base for summer camp, graduated in May of 1968, and was commissioned on the same day that, that I graduated. Uh, my, I got a delay to active duty from the Air Force so that I could attend uh, graduate school and work on a master's in microbiology. I uh, took the, well after the first year, uh, the department head changed and he did not like any of the research that I had done my first year, so he said it was going to take another couple of years to get my master's. So I knew that the Air Force was not going to let me have any more than uh, another year. So I took coursework, had a good time, and uh, finished Clemson with, or I left after seven years of continuously being at Clemson, six and a half of those years in the dormitory. Um, just lived off campus for about a one semester, which is totally unlike students do today. My first duty station after I went in the Air, Air Force was in um, Great Falls, Montana. Uh, before I went to Great Falls, so I went to a training school at um, at uh, Pensacola um, Tyndall Air Force Base near Pensacola, Florida. That was for three months. I had just been, I just gotten married. It was like a long honeymoon at um, in um, uh, in at the beach in um, at Tyndall. My wife had a great time. Of course, I was going to to school twelve hours a day. And uh, after two or three months, I forgot, well, it was two months there because I went in the Air Force on July the 4th, uh, 1968, and we moved to Montana in September, which was quite a, a culture shock and a uh, climate shock because the second week we were in Montana, we had six inches of, of snow. This is after being in, uh, in Florida for two months, having a nice tan, 
having but I only had my my short sleeves shirts and um, and all with me to go to that uh, duty in Montana. Montana winters were horrible compared to what they were in Walhalla, South Carolina. And after about um, uh, well, after January, we uh, uh, somebody came around and asked if we wanted to go to a, a, another training school. In um, well, they didn't tell me where it was at first, and I asked what the what the job was. And so instead of they, I was assigned as a weapons controller or intercept director, where we uh, kept the Russian bears bombers from entering the United States through Canada. We were very successful because no Russian bears entered the, the, the United States, so we, we, we did our job. But I did not like what we were doing. I didn't like Montana. So they asked if uh, anybody wanted to go to a school in Keesler, Mississippi. And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, what do you, do you want to know what school it is? And I said, it really doesn't matter. I want to, I want to go south for a while. So I went to a, a school uh, which was for, uh, it was in uh, electronics. It was uh, to be a radar inputs countermeasures officer. Um, I went to the school, learned as much as I could, went back to Montana in, in uh, June, May or June, and stayed there for another year and a half. Um, life was wonderful in Montana. Uh, the hunting and the fishing and the skiing and, and all were uh, fantastic. I, I hated to, to leave it at that time. I hated Montana for the cold uh, when I first got there, but I fell in love with it um, after uh, I'd been there for a good while. Uh, but we had, uh, I had to go on a remote tour, and the choices for remote tour were um, northern Alaska, uh, Iceland, mm -hmm. Vietnam, and Korea. Fortunately, they sent me to Korea. Uh, it, was Air, it was Osan Air Base, which is about um, 50 miles from Seoul, which at that time was about five or six million people. So being called a remote tour was uh, sort of a misnomer, except for the fact that uh, we couldn't have dependents there with us. I stayed in, uh, in Korea the longest uh, 13 months of my life and was then assigned to Hancock Field, New York, which is in, uh, which, at the airport, which is basically, which was basically half of the airport at uh, Syracuse, New York. Can you describe Korea for a little bit? Like what was your life like there and what was the uh, environment? At that time, this was during, this was in 1973, the entire year of 1973. So Vietnam was winding down and actually people pulled out of, uh, out of uh, Vietnam in uh, the summer of, um, of 73. Well actually they were, they were pulling out uh, earlier in the year too. So we had a lot of people who were weapons controllers in uh, Vietnam who had not been there but a few months and they had to complete a, a um, 12 month tour at a remote site. So a lot of those in Vietnam were sent to uh, Korea to complete their site. And I, I just mentioned that because we were so overmanned that we did not, it was really boring working there because we had so many people uh, we had you know full contention to start off with, and then we had a lot of people coming from Vietnam to 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 um, uh, finish their tours. The job there was to the the job that I had was to uh, monitor all of the um, intelligence collecting platforms, whether it was um, well actually well the the, the um, office that I worked in was created to uh, because of the Pueblo incident uh, back in the um, late 60s I believe it was where a naval vessel had gone out to, to 
delisting, uh, it's a listing post on the ship, and they went out to collect signals intelligence and other intelligence in um, along the North Korean border, um, not the border, the out in, in the ocean. <clears throat> uh, they were they were um, captured and spent a long time. Uh, all of the the um, the ship's company spent a long time uh, as prisoners of war in North Korea, and they determined that the reason they they were captured was because we didn't have any direct communication with uh, the people on the um, the ship to warn them that people were coming out to uh, to uh, intercept them and to to capture them. So this the office that I worked at. Um, was created to prevent that from happening again. So this office uh, was in direct communication to all of the intelligence collecting platforms, whether it was um, uh, high-flying aircraft or uh, fighters up close to the border that were collecting different types of intelligence, or um, naval ships at sea. My job was to, we, we knew when, we, when the um, the aircraft were going to be collecting intelligence from uh, the North uh, from North Korea. So we had to be in direct com communication with the pilots or somebody on that um, on that plane. And these were some of the real fast the SR-71s that that flew high and fast. And there's also some um, some F-4s that were actually. Um, just scrambled and, and went close to the border, uh, collecting different types of signals, information, and um, uh, communications that, that were going on within North Korea. <coughs> so it was something that we had. We had um, three shifts a day. Uh, somebody had to be there all the time. But because we had so many people uh, available to do this duty, we. Uh, worked sometimes half shifts. Sometimes we would work, um, you know, four shift, four days, and be off four. So it was there was a lot of downtime, a lot of boredom there. Uh, there was a a rather boring uh, time for me in Korea. The, the winters were were really cold, but not like they were during the the Korean War. Uh, that's about that's about it for for Korea. I mean, yeah. Was, so, did your family go over there with you? No. no. This was an unaccompanied uh, tour. My wife came over for about a month during the the summertime. She was in graduate school at Florida State, and so she had uh, the summer off, and she came over for about a, a month during the, the summer, and we were able to stay in. Uh, we stayed uh, in Seoul for. A uh, few days, and then I was able to get her an apartment uh, uh, nearby. She and that, that she was not able to stay on base. No dependents uh, uh, could be on <coughs> on base. Uh, could could stay on base. Okay. I believe it's a, an accompanied tour now, but at that time, no no dependents at all were, were allowed. But some, like me, had their wives come over during the um, during the tour there. So with all that downtime, were you able to travel much, or did you ever leave the base, or...? <coughs> Excuse me. My wife and I, the, right before she left, we went to Japan uh, for a few days, and then went back up to Korea. Or she may have, I think she flew back to the States, and I flew back to Korea mm -hmm. from uh, Tokyo. But um, while I was on... Um, Station at at uh, Osan, we were able to. I, I was able to go up to Seoul uh, just about any time I wanted to, which was really. I mean, there's a nice shopping up there, but at that time, Korea was pretty much a, a third world country. It was. It was very. Um, they, they did not have very much industry. Uh, they had been raped by the by the Japanese during uh, well prior to. Uh, the Korean War, because the uh, Japanese 
had um, occupied Korea for decades, and they they took everything of, of value from the Koreans. All um, all of the uh, timber. They just cut down all the forest. There was nothing nothing left there. So the, and the Koreans were. It was a pretty backwards country at that time. I'd love to go back to, to see what it's like now because it's a um, it's an amazing. They were amazing people in an amazing country. So were they were welcoming to you even oh, after their absolutely. experience? They were. They they the loved Japanese. the Americans. Okay. Because <laughs> um, they, I mean, they looked at uh, General MacArthur as a god almost. They, they just would, they worshipped him, and they uh, they loved the, the Americans. Of mm -hmm. course, the, Ameri the Americans hadn't been there. North Korea, the. Um, the communists would have totally taken over the South, and um, they may still be today. They may still be like North Korea is today. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just such a um, they, they were they were great people. I really liked them, and then, like I say, they they liked the Americans. But we were able to to travel. A lot of the ones, a lot of the people who were stationed with me, and I was a, a captain, Air Force captain, when I was there. And didn't have a lot of spending money, but what what I had was going back to pay for my, my wife's education. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the guys were able to, to get out and, and go to other cities in in Korea, uh, and some of them even had had uh, cars. I had a, a motorcycle. I bought a little, really small motorcycle, and. Several buddies had them too, and we would go out in the countryside, in the you know really remote people, the remote areas where the people didn't speak any English, and had hardly, I guess, boy, I'm sure they saw a lot of Americans during the uh, Korean War. And of course, this was just um, 12 or 13 years after the the Korean War ended, and so this mm -hmm. that was pretty recent in, in their minds. But we would go riding the motorcycles on. Uh, down in the end of the um, the dikes between the the rice paddies. I mean, was, and I look back and I think, you know, how, how in the world did I do something like that yeah. back then? But it was it was just an adventure, mm -hmm. and I'm adventurous. Yeah, clearly. But we, I was there for 13 months, from December until uh, January, right. of another year, and from there I went to. Um, Hancock Field right. in um, Syracuse. Yeah. So what did you do there? Well, the, I did the same thing there that I did in, in Great Falls okay. um, at um, Mount Washington Air Force Base. Was it a tough transition coming back to the States? No. Was it a tough transition? No. Yeah. No, I mean, that, it was, it, I was just so glad to be out of Korea. It was no, 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 I mean, it was not like coming back from a war. Mm -hmm. It was just, um, you know, we, we didn't have anybody firing at us there and no, Nothing, um, nothing bad. Or nothing. I mean, we didn't have uh, anything going on there. Right. It was just like I say, boredom. We, oh, and they even had a a nine-hole golf course what? on base. So I mean, it was you know, we're nice. playing golf there. Wow. Okay. And uh, uh, it was we had a uh, bowling alley. I didn't bowl, but they had a bowling alley. They had a a um, uh, library, so it was. There were a lot of things, uh, tennis courts. Uh, there were a lot of things to do on base, but um, uh, I didn't take advantage of as much of those as I should. I just, you know, well, I guess I did play tennis and some other things like that. But a lot of it we just spent uh, going to the officers' club and going to places downtown and mm -hmm. um, not not doing anything very productive. I'm sure others would contradict with that what you said, but uh, so in New York, um, what was what was the base like there? Was it similar? The base in Syracuse. Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, Hancock Field at that time was actually it's the name of the um, um, the uh, airport. Okay. I, think the, I think the whole place was called Hancock Field, and the Air Force had a part of that. And it was it was command center for the air defense command. Uh, don't believe we had no. We didn't have any. There weren't any active duty um, uh, fighters on base. There was a National Guard unit on base that uh, 
that had some fighters, but it was uh, you know just just the National mm -hmm. Guardsmen. But I was there for, for one year, I had to, it would have been a, a three year tour, but I did not enjoy Syracuse, New York. Uh, the average snowfall is 120 inches a year. And we were there, the, the year that we were there, we had maybe 90 inches of snow, which was plenty for me. Uh, I could not, stand the, the, that cold. I didn't like the area. Uh, the, the, the natives couldn't understand me. My wife had to translate several times <laughs> from, from my South Carolina accent. Uh, and I wanted, and I didn't like the job that I was doing. I didn't like sitting in front of a radar scope telling pilots where to go. Okay. Um, and I wanted to get a degree. I wanted to work in a in a hospital lab, and they weren't able to to um, to send me to any kind of training uh, because uh, they were overmanned with um, with medical technologists, laboratory officers at the time, and they weren't going to train anymore. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, my advice from some of the um, uh, higher ups in the Air Force um, uh, Lab Corps was to get out, get my degree in medical technology, and then get back in the in the Air Force. Because so I love the, the Air Force life. I just mm -hmm. didn't like the job that I had at the time. Mm -hmm. Me being a microbiologist, sitting in front of a, a radar scope, you know, using nothing but electronics. <clears throat> so I I got out, went to medical technology school. Um, in Anderson Hospital in Anderson, South Carolina, and that was that took one year, and then I started applying to to get back into the Air Force as a lab officer, or into the Navy, or into the Army. Well, the Air Force was so overmanned that they didn't even take my application. The Navy had um, they took my application, but they had something like 96 applicants and uh, six, six slots open. Mm -hmm. Well, at that point, I wasn't even competitive because I had just finished my degree, didn't have any experience. The Army um, said they wouldn't talk to me unless I had at least a master's degree in something. So at that point, I knew it was you know, no point in trying to get back into the, into the service. So I decided to become a um, school teacher because all of our friends in, in uh, Walhalla were teachers, relatives and, and friends were teachers. So I went back, I was, still had the, the, uh, VI, the GI Bill eligibility. So I went to, back to Clemson, got certified as a, as a public school teacher and taught for, um, well, I, I was also going, I was working as a medical technologist <coughs> at Anderson Hospital, but I started taking the classes at Clemson to uh, get certified. I got certified, I started working, I got a job at Pendleton Middle School teaching eighth grade earth science. And I did that for about two years, after which I said I would go on welfare before I, I taught anymore. because. I was being paid back for everything I ever did to teachers when I was in school. Um, so I I was still working as a med tech though at Anderson and uh, did I mention that I had a, a master's degree, I got a master's degree mm -hmm. too from Clemson in, in science teaching. So about that time, um, well let me back up, I wanted to get a job at um, Walhalla High School. I thought that if I could teach something besides earth science to eighth graders that I would be better off. Uh, so I wanted to teach chemistry or or physics or something else or even um, uh, bio, biological sciences, it's anything in biological sciences to high, to high schoolers. But they weren't uh, interested in somebody 
to teach that if you didn't coach. If I had ever played a sport and I could coach anything, I might have been able to get a job there. But at the same time, my wife was, was a librarian at uh, a little school in Oconee County. And she was trying to get a job at, at Walhall High School also. Well, the last straw was that uh, they had an opening uh, for a high school librarian. She applied for it. They told her that uh, they could not hire her because she could not be replaced at the little school at, at Oakway and that um, um, and they, they would have to hire somebody else at the high school instead of hiring her. So at that point, we realized that neither one of us had any um, future in the school system in Oconee County. Coincidentally, that week that we came to that conclusion, she got a letter aimed at, a letter from the Navy aimed at dissatisfied school teachers saying that they were, uh, would like to, um, uh, if they would consider going to, into the Navy and getting a commission, that they could do that. So she said, yep, I'm going to try that. So she got her commission. Uh, our first duty, her first duty station was um, um, Pearl Harbor. and. I, of course, went with her, found a job at um, a Triple Army Medical Center, at the, very close to where we were living. And then um, I also was able to transfer my commission to a Navy, to the Navy Intelligence, and was uh, assigned to a, a unit that drilled at Pearl Harbor. So that, that worked out just fine. Mm -hmm. When we left, when we left Hawaii, uh, she went to uh, Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, and I was able to get a job as a vet tech at uh, uh, Fort Oward, uh, which is an Army base just north of Monterey. We were there for about a year and a half, and she was transferred to the Pentagon in Washington, and I was able to get a job at uh, Walter Reed Army Hospital at um, uh, north of um, uh, of DC just north of DC so that worked very well mm -hmm. but uh, while we were living in uh, in Fairfax Virginia going to work there she decided that she didn't need to be married any longer so I thought well I don't have to live in DC any longer so I took uh, our son and moved to uh, Augusta Georgia and worked at um, at Eisenhower Army Medical Center at Fort Gordon. And later on, I transferred after about eight years, and I would transferred my reserve unit to a unit in um, in Marietta, Georgia, to mm -hmm. Marietta Naval Air Station. And so I was able to to work as a civil servant and work. Um, and uh, being, still be in the Navy Reserves. Mm -hmm. And then later, after I had been there for about five years, which is the longest I'd ever been in, in any place in, in my life, my adult life, um, I started looking for other jobs all over the United States, in you know, Army hospitals or other military hospitals or VA or Indian reservations or, or wherever. And the best offer came from the Food and Drug Administration in the D.C. area. So I thought, well, if I, I'll go back up there if I can live outside the Beltway and work outside the Beltway. And it, it, it did work out. So I went back up to, to, um, to the D.C. area, lived in Maryland, worked for the Food and Drug Administration for eight years, met my new wife there, and uh, drilled at uh, Navy um, at the Office of Naval Intelligence uh, on the other side of D.C. And it, well, there were about two or three units I was in during that eight-year period. What, sorry, what does this job entail? Because it's clearly different than your original job. What, what are you doing now, like in D.C.? What did that job? That, that job was, um, I was working for the Food Drug Administration. I was, um, 
working in the Office of Device Evaluation, of Laboratory Device Evaluation. Mm -hmm. So we were, um, this office approved or um, cleared new devices uh, that manufacturers were uh, trying to, to uh, sell to the public, mm -hmm. try, to, try to sell to, well some of them were over-the-counter devices like uh, glucose meters, um, others were sophisticated uh, multi-million dollar laboratory equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were, it, that, that office um, uh, reviewed and approved these uh, laboratory devices for for sale to the uh, to the clinical laboratories. Mm -hmm. So we did, like I say, I did that for about eight years, um, and then I it was that was in um, the late '90s when I was working there, and I was eligible for retirement when I was um, when I was would turn 60. Um, when in 1999, the Navy um, uh, forced me to retire because I had more years than I was supposed to have um, as a commissioned officer. At that time, they had, well they had passed a law in the 90s that said that um, that once a person had at least 28 years um, as a commissioned officer that if, if you had not been promoted to um, 06, which is like a army colonel or a, a navy captain, that you would have to get out. Well, actually, I was still a, a commander. I was, had been promoted to commander. I was commander at that time, and they uh, didn't catch me until I had 31 years in. Uh, was commissioned in '68. They discovered that, I guess, because of the um, because they had paperwork from me in the Navy. I mean, in the Air Force, and the mm -hmm. Navy didn't follow up on, didn't take a good look at the paperwork that I had uh, or that they had on me. So I was able to stay uh, as a commissioned officer for 31 years in the in the active and well a active duty, inactive reserves, and then active reserves. Mm -hmm. So I retired from the, the Navy in 1999, and about that time, I knew I could retire within a, a few years um, uh, as a uh, federal service, civil service. So I looked around in the, in the South Carolina, Georgia area to see what was available, and if, uh, if I could move, take another job down there. Mm -hmm. Well, at that time, this was, in um, 2002, and the in 2001 when we had when 9/11 happened, well, it wasn't 9/11 per se. It was after 9/11 when they had the um, the uh, scare with the um, um, oh gosh the um, can't. I, I'm a microbiologist and I can't think of the name. When uh, the, um, the, somebody had, had put um, powder, powdered, um, turn that off for a minute while I think of this. That's all right, it's all right, we don't need, it's okay. all right, yeah. Um, I can't think of the name. That's before. all right, so, so what about But that? anyhow. They, uh, somebody had was uh, sending uh, letters to different uh, oh, right, congressmen, right. Um, and it had no so worries. Was, if you just want to talk about the effects of it, that's fine. Um, what effects those letters had and whatnot on it'll come to me. But <laughs> anyhow, the CDC had developed. Um, laboratory test for the detection of a lot of agents of bioterrorism mm -hmm. and they when when that happened when that uh, the crazy guy started sending sending these letters with uh, this toxin in it um, they uh, 
Uh, in addition to, to that specific one, they had a lot of others that they were testing for, and but they needed to needed somebody to write laboratory manuals um, for uh, to, for public health labs to um, to, to use um, in the in the public health labs around the country, and so I. I applied for that job and got it. So I went to CDC to write the uh, laboratory procedures and, and manuals on how to, to test for these other mm -hmm. agents of, um, of all the agents for bioterrorism. There's about seven or eight different ones that they were testing. And what, what they were doing is the, the CDC provided uh, equipment and reagents to public health labs and eventually in 28 cities around the country where they would, uh, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, would, would collect uh, air filters, they would, they would uh, put an air filter out, put a um, system out that, uh, that sucked air in the city through this filter. They would take the filters, take them to the public health lab, and they would test it for these agents of, of bioterrorism. So there were eight, 28 of these, of these cities around the country. And after I wrote the, the uh, procedure manuals, then I um, was in charge of providing them with the equipment and the, the uh, reagents. Uh, and I did that for about two years. I decided that uh, since I had just turned 60 that I could retire. I uh, told my boss that and, and that I was going to retire and he said, no, he said, we, we can't lose you now. Yeah. So I said, well, I can, you know, I can make uh, uh, my retirement, I can draw my retirement pay and live in South Carolina and not have to come to Atlanta anymore. Uh, why would I, you know, make half my salary doing that? Why would I continue to work? He said, well, he said, we're going to make you a deal. We're going to change your, your job to a, a civilian contractor. Uh, and I said, okay, if you will um, pay me at least the same salary um, plus my retirement, uh, let me work in Walhalla. I mean, let me yeah, let me work out of Walhalla, and uh, let me go to all of the labs that um, I've been working with around the country. So that was the the best. I did that for yeah, two years, a little over two deal. years. That was the best job that I ever ever had, and Another I was finally and I was finally working as a microbiologist, yeah. uh, which is what I'd been trained to do at, at Clemson. Well, that's a great place to end your career then. Yeah. So obviously you did live essentially everywhere. Was it difficult moving around all these times, or no. wasn't? To me, well, I, mean, I, I guess I mentioned before, I've always liked an adventure, right. and each one of these I love traveling, and a lot of those. Um, jobs allowed me to move to an area, travel everywhere around there, mm -hmm. um, and you know, live there, uh, get paid for it. Right, uh, that's very cool. It was, so yeah, I've, I've been virtually everywhere in the, in the United States, um, lived in many places, traveled extensively other places. So just looking back on your career, what really stands out to you? Like what were the highlights and whatnot? The best job I ever had, well until I retired and mm -hmm. took that job as a contractor, the best job I ever had was working at um, Eisenhower Army Medical Center as a, um, I was the quality assurance coordinator for the, for the Department of Pathology. And so I was sort of the, the point man for if anybody in the laboratory, if, anybody, if the laboratory is having a problem with any area out that we served, uh, I would go investigate. If any place that we served had a problem with the laboratory, they would come to me. Uh, it was just, if it was problems all the time, mm -hmm. that, but people would say, well, you know, I don't see how you can stand this day. You're just dealing with, you come to, to work and you're dealing with problems all day long. And I said, yeah, but they're not my problems. <laughs> That's true. I'm helping other people resolve their problems. So I did, that was there, I was there for about five years and I loved that job. Mm -hmm. Job at the FDA was, was rather boring. 
but when I went back down to CDC, um, that job was was much more much more interesting, and um, and then it ended up being the the best job, the the dream job that, mm -hmm. that I've been waiting for all my life. Yeah, well, overall, it sounds like you had a great experience in the service and whatnot. I did. I mean, it, and it was the the Navy. I never during the whole time that I was in the Navy Reserves, I always felt that I was in the Air Force and just wearing the, the wrong uniform. Really? I, didn't, I never felt like I was part of the Navy because I never, I never was on a ship. Mm -hmm. Well, in the Air Force, I was never on a plane. I never had any duty on a plane. In the Navy, I never had any duty on a ship. Um, but they knew, you know, if they wanted me to serve on there, they knew where I was. So. Yeah. Well, that's great. Thank you for your service.